So welcome to part two in a three-part series using digital to grow your practice. It is being presented by Jimmy Stegall, MBA, CDT. Tonight is part two, digital application, removables, and lab communication. And we will begin the webinar shortly. And with that, it is my pleasure to introduce Jimmy Stegall, MBA, CDT, then uh, procedural solution specialist for the labs at Densply Serona. Jimmy Stegall is a seasoned dental lab operations and management executive with more than 43 years of teaching and clinical experience in the US and Canada. He is a published author and has assisted in research projects with dentists, universities, and manufacturers. After a successful 35 year career helping to build and lead a large dental lab in South Carolina, Jimmy is now a National Procedural Solutions Specialist for Densply Serona, where he has provided more than 400 clinical and laboratory educational events. As a key opinion leader, teacher, and trainer, Jimmy has demonstrated a history of providing relaxed, informative, results-oriented strategies and techniques to dental practices and labs throughout the United States. And it is our pleasure to have him as our guest speaker today. Take it away, Jimmy. Thanks, Jessica. Good to be back with you guys again. We will get right to it. Um, as always, you guys need to know I do work for Dents Plus Verona. That will validate and verify that your credits are applicable. So uh, last time we left off uh, at Crown and Bridge, and tonight we start talking about how to use our scanners in the world of dentures and digital dentures in, in general. Certainly a very hot topic. It's my number one requested program these days, and understandably so. So if I show you pictures of a lot of different dentures and asked you, can you tell which one's traditional or digital? If I ask you that question eight years ago, maybe seven years ago, it would be easy to tell the difference. Um, digital dentures at the time did not have the same look as what we were used to with acrylic dentures. But today, um, advances, materials, technology, we really can't tell the difference but there are some significant differences we're going to talk about. So one of the questions I love to ask groups is, you know, what is your favorite thing about doing dentures? And it's, you know, it's funny because the number one answer that I get, and last year I did over 180 programs, um, nothing. Right? And, and we, I know this because I spent years as the chair side person that uh, helped the dentist that worked with my lab on, you know, denture try-ins, uh, bites, uh, implant cases, all those things. And I saw the struggle in taking custom trays with border moldings and using bite rims and how challenging they are. And, you know, if we drill down on it and ask folks, you know, what is it that you don't like about dentures? Well, the impressions and bites have to be one of the most challenging uh, procedures to do in, in the operatory. Uh, bite rims are tough. There's no doubt about it. Even if I'm in the room helping, I, I see how hard it is hard for me too. you know, custom tray and border molding. It's, it takes some practice. Um, if we look at our patients and, and have the discussion, you know, they want to know, why does it take so long? Why do we have so many appointments? Why do I have to come back so many times? And then, you know, I remind techs a lot that, you know, when we do finally get dentures delivered, what we don't see as technicians is the fact the patient comes back to the office maybe two to four, five more times for post-delivery adjustments, which also, you know, gobbles up time on the book. And then heaven forbid, if we ever get through all that, and then they call us a week later and they've lost it or broke it, we've got to start over. So uh, generally, uh, most folks don't like. Now, I know somebody out there loves doing dentures and they're really good at it. And that's great. Those, those are the folks that keep us grounded. Those, those are the folks that, you know, help us learn about all the things necessary to learn to do dentures. But take heart, right? When we finish tonight, you're going to have some ideas about how you can do your denture treatments differently. And it's a lot easier. And you do want to do digital dentures. I, I can tell you after, you know, working in a lab where we did about 100 a day and 100 a day for a lot of years. And I dealt with everything that you've dealt with going chair side. And I, I can tell you that fit is the number one issue with dentures, right? It's the number one issue with patients. It's our issue, right? Adjustments, you know, uh, adhesive, all the things that happen, you know, to patients because they're not stable enough. They don't stay in well. Well, we'll talk about that a little bit, but it's really as simple as this. Um, when somebody makes an indenture, a denture out of acrylic using traditional workflows, be it old school press packing or be it uh, in so, some sort of injection of acrylic processing method, 
it's still acrylic and we're still doing it from a lost wax. We're still doing it with, you know, uh, temperature swings. We're adding stone, we're adding wax, we're adding boil out water. Uh, all those temperature swings and materials involved result in a product that just doesn't fit the way it's supposed to fit. And it's almost impossible to make it fit the way we want them to fit um, 100% of the time and 100% of the area. You know, ideally, a denture, if it wants to stay in, has to have an intimacy of fit to the tissues. Somewhere in the 100 microns, 80 to 150 microns is ideal. And what we're looking for is that perfect amount of space for saliva, because dentures don't stay in through suction. It's a term we've come up with to kind of help. But um, adhesion and cohesion, Dr. Wagner taught me that is, that's what holds them in, right? And what is that? It's a, that's a drop of water between two pieces of glass. And in order for that dynamic to work uh, physics wise, there's got to be the right amount of space. If it's too much space, then that dynamic dynamic doesn't work too well. And unfortunately, acrylic workflows, we just aren't able to get that kind of intimacy of fit throughout the entire surface of the dentures. Now, flip that over to the digital side. If I tell a computer to make part A fit part B, it's going to do it, right? And if the computer software will do it and spit out that denture in a file version, then all I need is a machine that will recreate it that's accurate and a material I can put in the machine that's accurate. Fortunately, today, after you know about 15, 16 years of development of the digital denture workflows, we have those things now. We can get a fit that is unsurpassed. I, I, I've seen digital dentures fit unlike anything I saw before. And all the clinical trials, all the appointments I've been in, I always hear it from both patient and dentist alike. I've never seen or felt a denture fit this way. So biggest win without a doubt is that you're going to have fewer appointments due to fit alone because we're telling a computer to help us out and make it fit as it should in the beginning. And having that digital record on file is the next biggest win for you. If anything ever goes wrong or we want to recreate something we've done, it's a file. We just pull it up and do it again. So all this totals to much, much uh, quicker workflows and more comfortable and better fits. So it, it, when I started, um, there were probably uh, 17, 18,000 dental labs in the United States, 79, 1980. And today they're less than 6,000, right? And, you know, labs are progressing quickly for sure, but you're still going a lot of labs today. And this is the way most dentures are made. It's the same way you learned and I learned, right? Somebody's got to be smart enough to know which teeth to pull out of the drawer and certainly know how to adjust them and set them and get them in the right position. And then, you know, have the skills to carve and festoon the wax. And uh, investing is a really highly regarded skill in my book. If you don't do this right, right, something's going to go wrong. But, you know, I show this video to lay folks and they say, really, that's how y'all make teeth. Said, yeah, it's kind of the way it's been done for a long time. And you know, we've gotten good at this, but remember it's acrylic and it's stone and it's boiling water. And we are not going to get that intimacy of fit that we need. We'll get it in an area or two of the denture, but a hundred percent surface coverage never happens. You, every study ever indicated of a denture fit, you never see that hundred percent coverage using traditional workflows. It's served us well, but, you know, it's time to look at a better option. And acrylic's still a great material, but when we look at a lab that's doing digital workflows, you're going to see them taking your records, right? That might be an impression. It might be a model. It might be a byte. And they are digitizing those records with the use of a lab scanner. The softwares are really good. They have all the tooth libraries that we know and love, right? They're stored in there digitally. We go get the teeth and we digitally set them. And, and then we export this design denture to some sort of device. It could be a mill or a printer. And we're going to print the parts that we need to fabricate our denture. And in most workflows, we're going to print a base and we're going to print teeth. Again, these could be milled or we could even use carded teeth. But there are lots of nuances to how this is done. But, you know, for an industry like the dental lab industry is really struggling, struggling to find technicians this really allows us to scale up because it's a much more efficient workflow. It's not intended to replace technicians. I still need somebody that understands teeth and, and where retromolar pads are, but um, it's just a tool. So it's given us a more efficient tool to be able to build these dentures right in the virtual world and then use some modern manufacturing processes to recreate our designs. And then all that's left to do is assemble them. So the steps associated that, with this process are much easier to teach and train folks. Now, again, somebody on the front end's got to know what's going on about where teeth go. So in the virtual world, we're setting these dentures up. 
but the assembly and printing and all those things could be easily teach taught to um, uh, new technicians to get them up to speed. And it would just allow labs to scale because we can take our trained folks and say, you know, we're going to, you know, instead of, you know, investing dentures all day, we're going to learn how to design dentures and, you know, we're going to get more efficient because it is 30 to 55% faster. So labs are really, this is one of the fastest growing things we've seen in the lab space for some time. Now, on the clinical side, this is uh, right from the textbook, right? This is what we all learned that a, a denture, conventional denture, should take five appointments. And, and I laugh at that still today because I, I, you know, again, you know, 40 years in the lab and 100 dentures a day, I don't remember many being done in five appointments. Typically in my world, visit um, four became 4A and 4B and sometimes 4C. And, and you know, there's various reasons for that. Um, and, and the bite is one of the biggest reasons, right? It's just hard to get a good, accurate bite with, with a, a bite round. So that's their traditional methods. But when we move digital, right, you know, what everybody would like to hear is, you know, hey, tell me what scanner to buy and tell me how to use it so I can start doing dentures. And, and I'm here to tell you that the technology is there. We can absolutely use today's technology to scan intraorally on a dentureless ridge. And as you can see, capture the image that we would need to make a denture. Now, what I haven't said yet is that while that scan obviously was done successfully, I haven't told you that it is the absolute positively most challenging, difficult scan to accomplish. So much so that there are very, very few people that are advocating that this is the way folks should go. There are much easier ways to use an intraoral scanner to do dentures, and the accuracy is actually better at this point because of the technology. But clearly, somebody's able to do it, and that means if they can do it, you can do it. But I can tell you, it just takes practice. So none of the dental schools that I've worked with, uh, not many of the talking heads, maybe only one or two, are really advocating you getting in there with your wand and scanning soft tissue. It's just too difficult of a scan right now. Algorithms will get better. Cameras will get better. And we'll be in a much easier workflow at some point in the not too uh, distant future, I would assume. But again, there's enough studies out there to, to convince us all now that the scanners are good enough to do it, right? They really are. The challenge becomes how to do it. If you want to dig into this more, Dr. LaRusso teaches in dental school in Italy and is probably um, the most groundbreaking uh, researcher on scanning edentulous arches with a digital uh, scanner. And go Google him and look up his stuff. Uh, you can get this uh, booklet from 3Shape or download it from the internet somewhere. And he's got scan strategies and lots of instructions. And uh, he's a great guy and he's, he really teaches well. And now I'm starting to see more show up on the lecture circuit, you know, to help educate folks and show what he does. But if you watch him do it on video, it's amazing. He makes it look easy. And every other dentist I've seen try to do it, they really struggle with it a little bit. So it, it is a challenge. Now, you know, don't lose heart. We're, we're going to show you how to use it, right, to be able to do things. And basically what we're going to do is we're going to use a little bit of a hybrid workflow. We're going to do a little bit of analog and a, and a lot of digital to make this work better. Because, again, there are benefits to doing a digital denture and we want to do them. So this is a study that kind of got all of us our attention about scanning uh, uh, for dentures. And this is actually a study that compared a traditionally fabricated denture from traditional impression methods. That's the one on the left. That's an intraoral scan on the right. And then that's a scan of a physical impression with an intraoral wand in the middle. And like any other color mapping denture fit study, you can see that green is better, right? So if I don't have green everywhere, like I said earlier, a traditional denture just very rarely gets it. It'll get it in places, but never 100% coverage, which is why all our patients use adhesive, right? It just never seems to fit well. So, you know, if we can get in the mouth and scan it, if we can get a good scan, it's better. But I still see some yellow, some blue tints and areas. Look in, look in the vestibule area, pretty difficult area to scan. But the, the scanning, the impression, it's almost all green. And, and this is the easiest scan to accomplish with your scanner. So, you know, that's the bottom line here. Uh, we're going to talk about ways to take impressions, right? And there's multiple ways you can do that. Take an impression traditionally, because everybody's in here pretty good at taking an impression, just a basic impression for a digitalist ridge, and then taking that out of the mouth and scanning it with the intraoral scanner. And that, that's pretty much the summary of the workflow. Once that's done, it goes in the lab, and the lab designs a denture and then outputs a denture. Um, some labs are still milling dentures, and that's great. Uh, we can get uh, pre-processed acrylic in pucks now. That's the same acrylic that we've always used. 
Uh, we can use traditionally carded teeth, so we can mill the base, we can bond some traditional carded teeth in, and we, we're done. And that's great. It's, it's a digital denture. And the fit, because we have some fantastic milling machines today, and the fact that that acrylic is fully cured, so there's no more shrinkage, so there's no boil out or wax or models, or we just you know put it in the mill and mill it. But um, not many labs are doing this because it's just... Uh, operationally ineffective, let's say that. So milling is what we call reductive technology. Reductive meaning, you know, I take something and I cut it down to something else and everything between those two points is waste. So that makes it expensive, number one, I gotta buy a puck to get a denture out of it and everything else, you know, it's dust just going out the back. Um, it's also not a very efficient process, it's slow. So um, in the beginning, it would take us about four and a half hours to mill one denture. Technology has improved since then, and now that's down to maybe two, two and a half hours, but that's still one denture, two hours, and it's just not efficient. If you got to do 100 dentures a day, that's not really reasonable to expect that. So we all knew that we'd be printing dentures one day, and, and our first generation of resins, you know, got us started, and thank we thank these folks for, you know, opening the door and saying, hey, we're going to figure out how to do this. And so they did. And they developed some resins to work with some of the printers and print the base, print the teeth, bond the two together. And boom, we had a digital denture that fit every bit as good as that mill denture was fitting at the time. Um, fit better than any acrylic pro traditional process we'd had. Um, it just didn't look like the dentures we were familiar with. And then we soon realized that it wasn't nearly as strong as it needed to be. They were very fragile. You could drop them on the tile floor and they would break. But again, somebody had to take this first step and we had speed, we had cost, we had accuracy. And so we were really excited about, you know, these first generations. All we needed was, you know, more and better printers and specifically more and better materials. We're in generation two resins now, been there for about six years, and we have some really, really good resins today. We'll talk about Lucitone, the, the material that NDX uses. Um, I call it generation two resin, literally pour and print. Work in a couple of different printers on the market, but if you look at it in the end, you would not hardly recognize it as being different from the dentures that you've always seen and done. In some cases, they look even better, right? And so... We started off using a printer, a company called Carbon, and Carbon's known not just in dentistry. They, uh, Rodell uses their printers to print these custom uh, shaped inserts for NFL players' football helmets, right? So Tom Brady wears a helmet with a carbon printed insert that's custom fit to his head. And, you know, that again, that's just technology and, and Carbon software and hardware figured out a way to do all this lattice work, right, to make it really, really safe and to help drastically reduce the concussion uh, protocols that we'd seen in the past. And, you know, so technology like that transferred over to dentistry just gets us more and more excited. And of course, other industries like you'll see uh, the same technology on the soles of Adidas shoes and hockey helmets, baseball gloves and bicycle seats. But the printers used in you know automobile industry that NASA uses the printer and 3D printing has really, really advanced, you know, and this is what we call um, additive technology as opposed to reductive, meaning we, we create something out of nothing, right? We print the part and the material that's left over in the printer, we pour back in the bottle. So it's, you know, hundred percent usage. So it's very cost effective. So, you know, that's where we are now. If you look in the lab space now on the clinical side, right? Oh, let's talk about the materials for a second. I wanted to share with you the materials that NDX is using. The Lucitone Digital Print System, well-known name. This has been around forever. Lucitone is a known factor. And, you know, when, when you look in an NDX uh, digital denture lab, you'll see technicians doing this, right? They're, they're on the computer screen. And the beauty of this is it allows technicians to create the denture tooth of their dream, right? We can scale teeth, we can morph teeth. I mean, it's just like designing a single tooth crown now. And we have all the tools in the software that allows us to do this very efficiently, very quickly. Um, typical setup, upper and lower full arch, including the digital wax up is about 30 minutes. Um, that's half the time to do that traditionally. If I'm doing that with wax and carded teeth, right? That, that's an hour, but I can do this in about 30 minutes, ready to be in the printer. So tools have just helped me be more efficient. And I think the occlusion is more accurate because computers helping me maintain that balanced occlusion. It's giving me all the tools and indicators that, hey, this is not a good thing. You need to fix this and um, all kinds of warning bells and buzzers if we go outside scope. So uh, software is just software, right? But 
you know, I still had to know where the retromolar pad was and know how to put those teeth in position. So it all starts with the design after the scan of your records, right? And then the lab says, okay, we're going to print this. And first thing we're going to print is the base. And Lucidone Digital Print Base is um, the first generation two resin leading the way. I mean, it's a polymer resin, it's not acrylic. So it's a totally new chemistry. And that brings lots of physical properties that's good for us, primarily strength, right? If you use a denser base, you, you want to have the name high impact on the box, right? You want to know that your lab's using a high impact. That's not just a marketing term. That means it's gone through some testing. And it, it the, the standard is if your denture can go in an Instron and not break before 900 joules per meter squared, right? you can have the words high impact on your box. And most all the acrylics that we've used forever um, are around 1,000 to 1,200, right? So any acrylic brand name that you're familiar with, you're probably looking at 1,000 to 1,200 joules per meter squared and anti-fracture. So that's great. Um, Boston University did all the validations for loose stone digital print. So it is a fully FDA validated system start to finish. And when they did the first test, they put it in the Enstron and right out of the curing oven, the denture didn't break until 1,500 joules per meter squared which is great, right? A little bit stronger. Um, but when you get FDA validation, you, you have to test it at room temperature and mouth temperature. So they heated it up to 98 degrees, put it back in the Instron and discovered that it does not break until around 3000 joules per meter squared. So it literally doubles in strength inside the mouth than it does outside the mouth and literally two to three times stronger than any acrylic on the market. So this is exciting, right? I immediately started thinking about all the midline fractures, all the uh, maxillary midline fractures, all the locator cases that had broken. And this would give us a denture base that we could maybe see a whole lot less of that. And then it's true, but you got to have the studies, you got to have the validations. But if, if you can't tell yet, I'm from the South and my accent's a little thick, but rednecks are going to test how we test, right? So taking them out in the parking lot and run over them a couple of times with the truck to see what happens is always a good test. And acrylic dancers are going to break under that every time, but the loose on digital print if, if it's heated up to 98 degrees, it's pretty tough to break it. I see folks throwing them off buildings and bouncing them across walls and all sorts of things. Now, I don't believe I ever had a doc, a patient call me and say, you know, I dropped my denture and ran over it with my truck. <laughs> Most of the time, you know, they said, you know, I was cleaning it and dropped it in the sink. So I always like tossing these dentures in sinks just to see what happens. And it's, uh, again, one tough denture and, and not likely to break in that scenario. About once or twice a month, you know, somebody would call and said, I delivered the new denture, the patient uh, took it home. And of course, this happens to everybody once in a while, the dog found it. So I've been giving them to Max for a couple of years to see what damage Max could do. And probably not a real test, but Max has not done any damage to the denture either. But in Boston, in the Instron, I, I watched this video and I think about an acrylic denture and it, an acrylic denture is going to break in the first few millimeters of movement. And this denture gets not heel to heel, but it gets pretty darn close before it finally does break. It's one tough denture and, and that gives us a lot of comfort, right? That we're gonna see fewer weekend calls, emergencies because of broken denture. So strength is not an issue. We, we know that it's a lot stronger than what we've always used. Labs like it because it's pretty easy to use, right? It matches the shades we've always uh, loved. And that, so there's no different there in the colors. So after the base, right, we've got to put teeth in it. and. We can still use carded teeth. We have carded teeth that can go in the digital dentures. Um, we can mill teeth, right? We can use a PMMA puck, which are very available and all the Vita shades and we can put it in a milling machine if we have it. But again, it's going back to reductive technology. So again, you're buying that puck, you're milling maybe three arches out of a puck. So everything else between all those arches of teeth is way. So it's, it's a little bit more expensive, um, but about half the cost of carded teeth. Again, 3D printing is really taking over everything. So, you know, we knew we'd be printing teeth as well. So our first printed tooth resin that was called Lucidone Digital Value, and it was originally developed to be the material for uh, the try the prototype, which we'll go over later, but also sent it back to FDA to get validated as a tooth. Um, along with some libraries that Densply developed, which are really unique, that makes the printed tooth look good. That's always the question. How do you make a printed tooth look good with gradiency and translucency and all that? And the secret is in the libraries. Now, there's some chemistry in the resins to give them some light reflection and refraction, but the, the libraries have a really significant impact on how teeth look. So we're pretty excited about how the libraries turned out because they're, they're anatomized. There's a, there's a lot of... Uh, uh, 
mamelons and horizontal structures and things like that in the libraries that make them look really good. Now, this resin, this loose stone digital value only comes in six shades and it's not as durable as say a mill tooth or a carded tooth. So, you know, our, our R&D team engineers kept working at it. And uh, about a year and a half ago, we introduced uh, loose stone digital IPN, which is our premium tooth resin. This one comes in all 16 Vita shades, plus a couple of bleach shades and strength. Um, it, it is the highest uh, wear durability of any printed tooth on the market. And, you know, the thing is, there's no government testing about denture tooth wear. So, you know, we, manufacturers kind of have to do this on their own, but this spa has been making denture teeth for you know almost 100 years and so they know how to test denture teeth and they tested the printed tooth exactly like they've always tested the carded teeth. Portrait IPN is, is Densupply's most popular carded tooth and uh, it tested at 0.09 uh, wear uh, to milligram wear after 400,000 cycles and the printed tooth tested almost identical. So here's the printed tooth that's as strong as any carded tooth, the best carded tooth we've ever done and aesthetics from the library um, aesthetics from the uh, resin itself. We're able to generate dentures that are absolutely beautiful with, with translucency and mamelons. Portrait used to be my favorite tooth of all time aesthetically. And now uh, this 3D printed tooth certainly uh, has taken my heart. I think it looks better than anything we ever did with any carded tooth. And the strength is there. So we, we have no worries, especially you know, we have all the shades. So we print our base, we, we print our teeth typically, and then uh, we assemble them, we cure them, and they're done. So back to the clinical side, right? And what can be cut out? What makes it easier for you? Well, we're going to kind of combine some things, but we're going to find ways to do this a lot faster and easier. And we're going to start, I think the easiest place to start is with the patient that's in the chair, right? Asking for a new set of dentures. Now, demographics tell us that 60 to 80% of those people already have a denture or dentures, right? That's a lot. That's a big percentage. And I'm of the mindset now that it really makes no sense to go back to ground zero and start over when we have data, we have information right in front of us. And the dentures may be old and they may be worn. Uh, they may not look very good. The patient may not even like them. I don't think it matters. I think there's data there that we can use to get us started. Now, we have to take some precaution here, right? If they're totally worn down and the patient's overclosed, then we're going to have to figure out how we're going to open the bite. If the occlusion's okay, um, we got to figure out how to maintain the bite, right? So I always am a fan of the dot on the chin and nose. Measure that so that when we do our next step, which is an impression wash in those existing dentures, we don't open the vertical. Right. And this is as simple as, you know, the typical reline impression with maybe, you know, a little bit more um, depth. And, and by that, I mean, we're going to do a heavy bodied uh, border around the edge of the denture. And then we're going to come back and do a light bodied wash. So it's a two step uh, reline impression, but it's just a wash impression. You know, and we're always going back to that dot on the chin and nose to ensure that we're not letting impression material open our bite. So. The, the process is simple, right? I like a heavy body polyvinyl siloxane, go around the border, put a little bit of adhesive maybe to help hold it on, right? Go in the mouth and do some border molding movements. Now I got these from Eric Kakucha, great process, but there are about six or eight different ways of getting border molding movements, right? Eric's is, you know, ooh, ah, e, tongue out, left and right with the tongue, close, swallow a couple of times. Other people, you know, massage the cheeks, have people uh, pucker up, stick their tongue out, whatever, you know, works for you is fine. We just want to record those borders, right? I don't want to just put a static impression in. So we want to put it in, go through those border molding movements, let it set, take it out, put the wash in, right? And then go back and do the border molding movements one more time. And that sets up, right? We take it out and we have an upper impression, do the same thing on the lower. Uh, then, you know, we take a bite registration. Again, that could be exactly where the patient's existing dentures fit. If we're happy, if we're not, we're going to open that bite and take it with an open bite. That's okay. The scanners can record all that. So we have this assembly, right? This is a reference denture assembly, upper impression, lower impression, and bite registration, which are the three scans that the laboratory needs to, to make a, a new set of dentures. That can go to the lab and that can go in the lab scanner. Most patients, right, do not like being without their dentures, even if they're not super crazy about them. Um, plus, most of you have an intraoral scanner now. So we should get that scanner out and we should scan that impression in the office. And that's pretty easy to do. 
right? All we're going to do is, again, get the dentures ready. This was a case that we had to, this is Dr. Stephen Wagner, uh, prosthodontist out in Albuquerque, had to do a little restoration on the heels, but after he got it restored, you know, heavy-bodied border, light-bodied wash, bite registration, patient was very comfortable in her plane of occlusion, so no opening of the bite here, right? And then take the dentures out and start scanning. Again, most current scanners do this very easily, very quickly. Um, takes a little practice, but it's not hard. And some you start on the intaglio, some you start on the teeth. Really depends on the scanner and the software. But this is the prom scan we're looking at here. Um, I now start the prom scan on the tooth side and I, I capture the buckle, roll up over the border, and then roll into the intaglio. Uh, it takes me about a minute and a half to two minutes per arch. It's that quick. If you notice, I'm not scanning the, the palatal or the tongue side of the denture. We don't need it, right? We're scanning an impression, not a denture. So I just need intaglio, borders, buckle services, and then we'll do the same on the lower, and then we'll scan the buckle bite. So it's a pretty simple scan. The impression is pretty simple. You guys have been taking reline impressions forever. Patients are happier, better, because even though they may not like their existing dentures, they know where they go. So they can help us as we're trying to record the bite registration and ensure we capture everything well. So this is kind of a win, 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 right? And, and so, you know, it's easy for the patient. It's easy for the doctor and staff. Uh, the lab is going to be very happy because they're going to have data they never had before on this initial impression. And that's all this is. This is an initial impression or preliminary impression for our dentures. So we're going to scan them that way. And we're going to send those three scans to the lab, right? And the lab's going to bring them in, right? And our software gives us the ability to say, oh, this is a digital impression of an impression, right? You use a digital impression wand to scan uh, uh, an impression in a denture. Okay, so I set that up as a digital impression. And then the lab software virtually pours that model, right? So now I have two stone models that are in the exact position of those two dentures and the bite you recorded. That's what you're looking at here. The purple is the patient's existing dentures. The white is my setup. So you can see that the existing dentures give me a guide. I can see buckle quartered. I can see occlusal plane, midline, and sizal edge. You may say to me, you know, overall pretty happy, but she'd like to show a little bit more teeth. That's okay. How much anterior length do we need to add? You say a millimeter. Boom. I, you can see I dropped these down about a millimeter. So this is almost a template or a paint by numbers. It becomes one of the easiest setups to do in the lab space. This is where I would start a new technician. You're going to do all the reference dentures, right? So even if the bite's open, right, we still have a guide right, of where everything is. So this is data we never really had accurately with the bite rim. So we're going to design a denture. We're going to print out a monolithic prototype, right? And this is, some people call this a try-in. I like calling it a prototype because that's what it is, right? We're going to uh, have the ability to put this in the mouth and really work on it. So now think of this as the best bite rim you've ever had because it's got teeth on it. And the teeth are probably in pretty close proximity where they need to be because of the data we got from the patient's original denture. But if they're not, right, you just start making notes, right? And you can do that in multiple ways. You can draw on these things. You can add wax or composite, or you can get your burr out and your paper and tap grind, tap grind, and just record the changes if this prototype is not perfect. When I saw this, and I've been working with this now for about four years, I said, I mean, I think we just eliminated a custom tray and bite rim because the prototype actually becomes that for us, right? If the prototype is not perfect, then we modify it to our liking, and then we take another bite and or another impression in it. And we don't need a custom tray. We don't need a, a bite rim because we can take those modifications, scan them, bring them back into our software, make the changes, right? And then go ahead and print the final. And so we start with the reference denture scan. We go to prototypes. And, and I can tell you after four years of experience, most of the time, you're not going to have to do a wash impression, right? The wash impression that you do in the patient's existing denture is so easy to do and, and so working out so well um, that very rarely do we have to do anything else to the inside. Now, sometimes there's midline and, and bite things off on the posterior or whatever. And occasionally we'll have a missed impression wash and we'll have to do something over. But most of the time you really don't. So much so that some labs have said, I'm not printing the prototype anymore. I'm just going to print the final and let that be the try-in or the prototype for the doc. If it's right, which a lot of dentists were saying, I had one lab tell me that, Jimmy, four out of five docs are calling me and saying, 
the prototype is so spot on that if it would have been the final, I would have delivered it. But that led me to go ahead and process, you know, not print the prototype, but just print the final and just tell them, look, if it's not right, then make the modifications and we'll print another one. But four out of five times, they don't have to do that. So it's all good. So reference entry is your first and easiest way to get into this workflow. Immediates, I would say, is your next easiest way. If you have an intraoral scanner, you should be doing immediates digitally. Right, because you can scan the upper, you can scan the lower, you can scan the bike. Those scans can go to the lab and the lab has something called the virtual extraction tool where we can virtually take the teeth off the model, but yet it's digital. So they're really still there. All we have to do is turn them on and off so that when I'm doing a virtual setup, I can turn on the extracted teeth and it, I can use them to guide me in the setup. This is data we've never had with immediates before. right? And so this makes our immediate setup a whole lot better. So, you know, we'll use that technology. We will create the dentures. We'll print out the, the immediate, send it. And, and typically I would send out the, the monolithic prototype. It's the same material as the pink, by the way. It's just as strong as the pink. So the patient can wear this forever if they want to. But um, of course, aesthetically, it's not ideal. Um, but I would send the monolithic prototype, maybe paint pink on it because for the eight week healing period, you know, dentists would do the extraction, deliver that with um, a soft liner treatment, tissue conditioner, um, let the patient heal up. And when they come back, take out the uh, soft liner and put in an impression wash. And at that point, it's the reference denture workflow and we can make the changes accordingly. So yeah, there's a monolithic from Dr. Wendy Clark at UNC where the pink was painted on to make it look a little better you know, for the patient's healing period. Copy dentures is a great workflow. You need to ask the folks at NDX about a copy denture. This is for that patient that's in the chair and says, yeah, doc, I'll take a new denture. Um, if you can make it just like the one I got. I love this one. You know, and sometimes we look at those dentures and say, wow, um, thanks to my friends at Roe for sharing this case. This is one where the lady said, yeah, I really want it like this. You know, wow, the teeth are worn. Yeah, I know. I really want it like this. So, you know, but she said it doesn't fit like it should. So, you know, wash impression, right? And then the lab can scan it. And what happens is the software allows us to virtually separate the teeth from the base. So now we have two files, right? A file of teeth, a file of base. We print the two right? Assemble them and we've got the same denture. And so, you know, this patient said, wow, yeah, it feels exactly like my old denture, but it's staying in a lot better. Yeah. That's kind of the whole point here. You would, you wanted a copy. So we made a copy. So the copy denture uh, workflow is typically less expensive from the lab because they don't have to do the setup and arrangement and designing of teeth, but I'll, it varies from lab to lab. Just remember that when we're scanning a reference denture, right, the one on the left, we are scanning intaglio borders and buckle only. I don't really need the tongue side of the denture, but if I'm Scanning for a copy denture, right? I'm copying that denture. So I do need a full 360 scan. Now, a full 360 scan of a denture is a little bit more challenging than scanning just the intaglio and buckle sides because of that palatal tongue side is sometimes a challenge. And so you could use spray. Um, some folks use the purple markers, uh, indelible markers. Um, I like to put a few drops of tiny drops of wax along the palate somewhere that gives the scanner reference points. Anything that can help give it reference points will ease that scan job a little bit. So partials, implants, absolutely, right? It's a material that's super strong. Why can't we print uh, flipper type partials with it? Why can't we print our uh, implant conversions? In fact, you know, some labs that who's they're 100 percent, you know, all on X type labs. Uh, they use loose on digital print for their conversions because it's so strong and not using a, a strengthener anymore because of the strength gain. Uh, locator dentures, final dentures, of course, conus, same thing. You know, any over denture, I'm going to get the strongest denture base I can get. And that, that happens to be the loose tone. A Dispod brought this product out, you know, a couple of years ago, and it's called Bridge Base. And basically, it, it, they created a new scan post to take advantage of the accuracy of the prime scan at the time. Now, other scanners have, have caught up and, and they are they have matching accuracy. So I don't think it's scanner specific anymore, but you put this scan post in and scan it intraorally, and that can go to the lab. And this, this, this data is so accurate, guys, that the lab can... Um, get a metal framework fabricated through what's called selective laser melting, basically 3D printing, right? And get a file for that, you know, within 24 hours. And then they can design a zirconia overlay for that in their own lab, right? And then the next day when the metal framework actually gets there, they just bond the two pieces together and boom, you've got a three unit screw retained bridge all from an intraoral scan, which doesn't need a verification appointment. And translate that to a full arch, 
right? Uh, this is amazing to me that we can make a full arch piece of metal through selective laser melting, which is digital, right? From a digital intraoral scan, right? From great scan posts. And we can get this metal bar and it fits passively every time and you don't even need a model. And thanks to my uh, friends at, at Absolute for sharing this video with Dr. Ludlow, which is Mark Ludlow at Utah, you know, worked on this case and look, this was um, scanned intraorally, right? The bar was ordered. The lab made a zirconia top and a printed Lucitone digital print top from the same file. And the bar fit perfectly in both. And this is two different, totally different manufacturing processes, two totally different materials. And to have that kind of accuracy fit, the only way that can happen is digital. And then the, the biggest icing on the cake is the fact that that bar, that superstructure, that assembly, once everything's glued together, you've got a full arch permanent implant restoration that required no verification appointment for, for an impression. So that's what digital has done for us. And, you know, we, we appreciate all the work that folks have done getting us there. So yeah, flipper partials, labs everywhere, printing loose stone digital print in form of a flipper partial, super accurate flipper partial that just happens to be twice as strong as acrylic. So why not, right? So if you've got a scanner, right? I know everybody says, I really, really want to use it for dentures. Here, here's what I recommend to folks. Get your scanner out, scan your upper and lower arch. Now you can tell from these scans, they're not 100% accurate for dentures, right? We're missing some data. But I would say we've captured 70, 80% of the data and we can use that data because it's good data, what's there, right? And we can use it to fabricate digital base plates, right? We will design them in the software, we will print them in the printer and that just makes a much better base plate. We'll make some bite blocks or bite rims for those, right? We'll send them to the dentist. We'll get you to use an impression wash in that base plate on the upper and on the lower, then put the bite rims on and take a bite registration. So now I have an upper impression, a lower impression and a bite. We do that all in one appointment. Then we take those analog type impressions and bites out of the mouth and we scan it with the intraoral scanner and send those files to the lab. And we can now start and design the dentures from that data. So um, we already talked about partials. We, what we didn't mention was cast partials. If you have an intraoral scanner, absolutely. If they're teeth, the more teeth, the better. Clearly, the longer stretches of soft tissue the scanners struggle with. But if you've got teeth, um, scan it for your partials. There's nothing wrong with that. We've been, we've been doing that for a long, long time. That, that data is really good to labs. Labs take that into the lab software, design the metal frames. And then maybe like what I did was we uh, printed in a printer, a wax printer. So we had wax uh, Instead of hand waxing cast frames, we would just print them and then go invest and spread them and cast them. But there are also companies that you can send those digital files to, and they were they will use a 3D metal printer. We can send them to a milling machine and we can mill things like flexible resins. We'll have printed flexible resins one day, not quite yet, but they're getting close. Right now we're still milling all the flexibles, but designing in the beginning from digital is where it all happens. Um, other things like night guards, of course, implant bars, impression trays. Um, and so um, we go through what the, the folks are doing in night guards. So if you, again, intraoral scanners, scan it, right? Scan the upper, scan the lower, scan the bite, send that to the lab, right? The lab, most labs now, I know NDX does this, they have um, a, a liner service, right? And so they can do all the groundwork for you. All you do, send the scans to the lab. And, and they can design them and have them printed for, for night guards and ortho aligners. And these, these happen to be night guards. And everywhere I go, I see labs printing these clear night guards every day. And it, this is kind of a you know, pretty easy thing to do. Um, and of course, so many of them are done for patients these days. But it's just like the dentures, right? Just like any other 3D printing, we're going to design it. We're going to print it. We're going to clean it up shine it up and out the door it goes. And again, compared to way, the way we started making um, night guards, it, that's night and day and so much better. So uh, this scan protocol is kind of the gold standard of scanning a full arch of teeth. It varies from scanner to scanner, from, from lecturer to lecturer, but this pretty much we start on the occlusal or a 60 degree buccal or lingual position. You know, we make a round, then we come back across the occlusal, then we roll over and then we just, you know, make sure we get the gingiva. Some scanners are quicker and better because of head size or algorithms, but pretty much the way it works. Now, 
Next time, we're going to talk a little bit deeper about implants and where, how we use these scanners uh, to make our implant life better, right? And so um, this was mostly about ventures. And um, with that, now we'll bid everybody do again. Uh, don't forget to fill out the survey and tell us how we can help you. Right, take care. Good night.